Hello. No, this is Tanya. Yes, hi, how are you? Yeah, it's my pleasure. And you do know that I'm recording the phone call, right? Okay, beautiful, beautiful, wonderful. So how are you doing, my dear? Where are you located? You sound like you have a little silly accent. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right. So you said that you've um you said that you've been watching my videos. Okay, cool. And so what was it that made you decide to do this interview? Yeah. No, you t it took me a few days before I read the article, and um when I did, I was like, um okay. <laughs> <laughs> I was so, I was really, yeah. I was really surprised by the the stance that the the writer took on the article, but you know, we're all entitled to all our opinion. And so you said you wanted to, you wanted to talk about um just the you wanted to talk about the aspect of the following your dream aspect of the journey. Is that is that correct? But if you want to start with the questions now, that'll be cool. Well, you know, the um, the Displacement Diaries is um, a little bit behind real life because um, there were some episodes that had three and four days in it that were published one day after another. And they were, then I wasn't publishing on Sundays. And so it's a few weeks behind right now. So the video that you saw is actually what happened about a month ago. Yeah, it just, you know what, it just kind of, it just kind of, you know, it's like when you're, when you're doing a daily vlog, um, if you miss a day, you're pushed behind by a day. If you miss two or three days, you're pushed behind by like half a week. And then if, if a few weekends go by without you publishing every single day, then you just, you start getting pushed behind by like a week. Cause like I first, I first started falling behind, um, right in the very beginning um right after right at, i actually started publishing every day because of the criticisms i got after i got the money once i got the money i started looking for a place feverishly and i was concentrating all of my efforts on that and people were like oh look now she got the money now she's not making videos anymore so then i originally lost the first two days it was like two or three days in the very beginning and then when I had, when I, when I went to the red carpet, I was there from Friday till Sunday. And so I, I lost another three days there. So it's like when you lose three days here and three days there, that's six days, which is a week. And then a few of the episodes had like four, four episodes publishing every day. So when you, when you're behind by six days, then another four days. But it's like, you see, cause I was publishing every day. However, um, when, when the episode was broken up into four pieces, because nobody knows this, nobody knows this publicly. You'll be the first, you'll be the first person that I tell this to. Um, I had gotten, someone had, there was, there was a, there was a YouTuber who had told people to flag my channel, et cetera. And, um, and so, you know, I'd gotten several flags on my channel in the very, very beginning. And so what happened was I wasn't, my, I had gotten some strikes on my account. And when you get strikes on your account, when you're in the process of appealing, and this is, I didn't want to say this publicly because I didn't want more strikes. But what ended up, what ended up happening is I could not make videos that were longer than 15 minutes. So it was like while I was behind the scenes trying to battle the, the strikes, I couldn't make videos that were longer than 15 minutes. So I had to break the videos up. So, you know, I'm, and you know what, everything happens for a reason. And it was a blessing in the way that it happened because, you know, I, I'm used to making 30, 40 minute videos. And like, even in the beginning of the displacement diaries, the videos were like 20, 25, 30 minutes. And then after I got that strike, immediately the videos had to drop down to, to 15 minutes. And so that's when I started making 14.9, 14.59 minute videos. And, um, and, you know, at first people were like complaining. They were like, oh, why are we getting these short videos? But I couldn't talk about it in public because I didn't, I didn't want the people who were striking me to know that it was actually having an effect on my account. Um, so I started making shorter videos and then I had to publish um, one a day. And so that's how, the, that's how the Displacement Diaries originally started getting pushed behind schedule. 
And, um, and so, yeah, and you know what, it's been a blessing because the shorter videos are, you know, at first it was hard for people to get used to the shorter videos, but then even after I got my account out of, out of the strike, I think like I came back with like a 20 minute video and then a 20 minute, three minute video. And then I just dropped back down to like 15 minute videos because 15 minute videos are manageable. So even though it was like a, a, a bother at first, it really turned into a blessing for the show, for me, for my discipline of being forced to keep videos under 15 minutes. Yeah, about a month ago, and then now I'm only publishing three days a week, so we're, so time is making it spread out even further now. It's, I don't know how other people do daily vlogs. It's ve- daily vlogs are very difficult, very difficult, because you, know, you have to edit every single day, and the videos take, especially like when, it, when I was first editing them, the videos were like, it would take... Um, just enough time to chop it up. It was taking about two or three hours before. Now it's taking with the music and the and the video clips and cuts and all this other stuff. It takes about six hours to do a video. It was really difficult. It was really difficult. Stay tuned. Stay tuned. It's um, everything becomes revealed. You know, I I always believed in myself. You know, and so that that helped. But the way things unfold is in a way that I didn't even expect. I didn't even expect to happen what happened. And everything. It's like when you when it comes together, you're gonna be like, wow. You know what? That makes so much sense. <laughs> it's like, you know what? Oh my goodness. Everything whether it seemed like it was a curse actually really turned into a blessing. Everything, every single thing along this journey in life, everything, anything that had seemed like a hardship actually really turned into a blessing. Well, I only traveled for eight months. I went out of the country 2015 to write the books. Um, I went to, I went, yeah, I went to Latin America to try to write the books and the, the trip was, was difficult. So, um, so yeah, so I came back and the books weren't written. And I, um, I, I stayed in New York for a few months, uh, about three, I stayed in New York for about three months, um, just going to the YouTube space in New York, you know, making videos, um, really kind of trying to figure out what it was that I wanted to do with the Tanya TKO show. And my spirit called me to go back to Los Angeles. Um, my spirit told me that LA is where I needed to be. So I took care of all of the things that I needed to take care of, and I did all the things that I needed to do, the networking and all that other stuff in New York, and then I headed out to Los Angeles, and um, and I was staying with a person, I when I first went to Los Angeles, I um, yeah, I don't know how much of this, the, the details of this story you want, but... I was supposed to be renting um, one of the bedrooms in the home of an associate, and when I got when I, I, I when I got there, the situation was a lot different than I thought it was going to be. And I was actually sleeping on the couch, and um, and you know what? It actually the way to gosh the way that it turned out when I was um, uh, just just to be fully transparent. Um, Four days before I was supposed to leave to go to rent the room inside of her, her apartment, um, she told me, oh, well, you know, my daughter is is going to be staying inside the room, you know, so I don't really have the room to rent to you anymore, blah, blah, blah. And she was like, you know, you could stay on the couch for a few weeks. And so then I, I came out there. When I was at the airport, I started getting all of these emails just from my different banking institutions letting me know that my accounts had been levied, that they'd been gleaned, and that the money had been taken out of them. Um, and, uh, yeah. And so I had a few thousand dollars left over after that long, extensive trip. It's like, you know, I, and, you know, I, I hear criticisms from people, and I hear that the average American can't go 60 days without a paycheck. And I went from what, July 2014 to January 2016. I went a year and a half with, 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 no, with after closing my business, I went a year and a half, you know, on the money that I had saved. And I only had a little bit left after that year and a half. And all of that was taken. It was all taken. I, um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, you're so funny. <laughs> 
Yeah, but you know what? It was my fault. It was my fault. They, when I was out of the country, I wasn't getting the, the, the correspondences that were letting me know that there was a problem. There were a few different things. I didn't, I didn't close out my business properly. And when you don't close your business and you're collecting sales tax, um, you, they, will, they will average what it is that they feel that you owe. So from 2014 until January 2016, they averaged what they felt that I owed plus what I didn't give back. Um, so, you know, you collect sales tax and you're supposed to give it to them. So not only not all, all the sales tax wasn't given back. And then on top of that, they had averaged what they felt that I owed. So it was just a, it was a big it was a big mess. You know, the uh, gosh, the couch situation, you, you know, the things things in the, in, the, in the house didn't really work out. Um, and it was more I, I was I was at an all day seminar. This is how it happened. I was at an all-day seminar at YouTube, and it was like a, it was a few days seminar. And when I first became this place, I figured I'd find some place to stay, you know, for the night to kind of try to work things out or whatnot. But since I was at the all-day seminar, I got out of the I got out of the seminar. It was about nine o'clock. I started looking for a place to stay for the night. I couldn't really find a place, and um, and then and then I was like, you know, I'm going to be right back here in the morning. And it's like in Los Angeles, it costs a hundred, hundred and twenty-five dollars to 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 stay for a night in Los Angeles. Plus one twenty-five plus, it just goes up. To stay at the Motel Eight is ninety-nine dollars a night. And this mm-hmm. is, it's like it, it's really the situation out there is crazy. So when I was looking at it, I was like, you know what? I got to be right back here in the morning. So I might as well just you know catch a nap in the car, come back here in the morning. So I went to a construction site. And they had like all, all my security over there. So I stayed, the very first time I stayed by the security booth, I told the security guard, I was like, look, I'll be in my car. Um, and you know, the security guy looked out for me all night and I, I slept in my car. Um, however, construction started on the security, on, I mean, the construction started on the site at about four or five o'clock in the morning. So that really interrupted my sleep. And so that wasn't a place that I could stay, you know, long term because of that. So yeah, so it just started out with me thinking that I was going to spend the night in my car one night. And then one night turned into two. And two nights turned into a week. A week turned into almost three. And when I got to the 18th day, that's when I made the video. Before we, well, I'm not even talking about that now. Um, you said that by the 18th day, you decided to make the video. What epiphany you had then that said, hey, you know, I should be documenting it? Well, you know, the original video wasn't even a, a documentation. The original video was a, was a, a, a call for help, a plea for help. Um, the What happened is, because, you know, I would go to the Starbucks daily or the YouTube space to edit um, to make videos, to um, just to just stay in the in the realm of creative people, because I was in my car. I really didn't have anywhere to go during the day. You know, it's like where do you go when you when you have nowhere to go? You know what I mean? It's like I'm in a new city. I don't have no place to chill. What do you do during the day? And it's difficult to stay in the car because it's hot out there. It's hot during the day, so it's like you got to go somewhere. And the only place that I knew that had free Wi-Fi a bathroom and food was Starbucks, you know? Um, Mm -hmm. And so uh, I met a guy at Starbucks and we got to talking and the guy told me that he was also displaced. He was living in his car. Um, And I was like, oh, wow. And at the time I really didn't know where to sleep with the car because, you know, it's like I was new to it. And it was, it, it was like I was staying in residential areas and people were going to school in the morning and all of this other stuff. And I felt kind of weird getting out of my car, you know, parked in front of people's houses. So this guy said that um, he was parking on the, the, the roof of this, of this big box store. And so I was like, oh, wow, really? And so like the first night, you know, I, I parked up there where, you know, where he showed me, it was a really quiet night. He was in his car up there. I was in mine. So I felt a little, um, a little, a little safer. And then I, then the next day, um, I think he went and he spent some, he spent the night someplace else. So it had been about 
two or three days that I was on the roof by myself. And that particular night, like the um, the, the motion sensor, because like the the lights, the the you know the like the, the street lamp things on top of the on top of the roof would go off. But this night, like the motion sensor was making the lights come on, and I heard some stuff outside the car, and I was I was I was freaking frightened. I was frightened. And I was like, I can't do this. I can't do this. I had actually, um, I tried making a video the day before, you know, asking for help. Um, I had spoken to a subscriber of mine. Like, my, like I, wasn't, I wasn't posting videos. And so, like, my subscribers were, like, tapping me on the shoulder, like, Tanya, what's up? We haven't seen you made a video. Because it was, like, it was January. I hadn't made a video since, I think, like, Christmas. And I usually post videos once or twice a week. And so I hadn't made a video since, um, since even before Christmas. Like I uploaded a video around Christmas time, but I hadn't made a video like a month before that. And so it had been like two months since I made a video. And they were like, Tanya, where are you? Because I wasn't, I wasn't really posting. I, I just kind of like disappeared. And this one particular subscriber, she was like, um, you know, where are you? And this is a subscriber that had been following me. Her name is Kim. She tapped me on the shoulder. She had been following me since 2007. And, um, and so, you know, so I opened up to her and I let her know what was going on because I was really embarrassed at first. I was really, really, really embarrassed. You know, it's embarrassing sleeping in your car. It's embarrassing not having money. It's embarrassing being grown and not being able to take care of yourself. And, you know, but I opened up to her and, um, and I told her what was going on. And she was like, wow, you know, you should make a video about it. She was like, you know, you always share the ups and the downs with us. And that's what we, we love about you. And so after she said that, I was like, yeah, you know, she's, she's right. I should at least let people know what's going on. So I tried to make the video. The very first video that I made, I, try, I tried to do it. But I was so embarrassed. So I was like, no, I, I can't. You know, and then I think it was the next night was the night that I was like really frightened. And I was like, I, I just, I, I, I couldn't find a way out of the situation. I just, I don't. I don't make that much money from YouTube AdSense. I don't make that much. And it's like, you know, you're caught in this really weird, you're caught in this weird conundrum because it's like you're, you're internet famous. It's like you have all of the down parts of celebrity. You know, you have the, the living in a, in a fishbowl. You have the, 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 um, the people who know your face and all this other stuff and people who are following you and, and are, you know, are criticizing you. So you have all of the down parts of celebrity with none of the upside because you don't get, YouTube just doesn't pay. Like people think it pays. Like I see people writing like, oh, I, I may quit my job and go do YouTube. No, YouTube doesn't pay you enough to make money. I mean, I, I can't, I, because of the terms of service, I can't talk about the actual breakdown of pay. But I will say this. You need to make millions of views per month, millions, to just barely make it. Millions of views a month. So if you're getting tens of thousands of views, even hundreds of thousands of views, that's not enough to live off of. That's barely enough to buy groceries with, honestly. A week of groceries. If you're making 100,000 views on YouTube, that's about enough to buy a, week work of, a week's worth of groceries. One week. Not rent. Not salary, not buy clothes, not take care of your children. It's like, you know, there are some, there are some, there are some, um, some stories, you know, some, some magnificent stories on YouTube. But those people are making millions of views. They're getting millions of views a month. There are they're, they're people who are making tens of thousands of dollars per month on YouTube. But they're getting millions, they're getting millions of views. They're getting tens of millions of views. You really, if you really think about it, and how do you pronounce your name? Shereng? Yes, yeah, Shereng, yeah. Shereng, okay. If you really think about it, Shereng, where does the money come from online? It's like, you know, people who have like these, these Instagram pages and the Facebook pages. As a matter of fact, Facebook wants you to pay for your stuff to be seen on Facebook. It's like, where does the money come from? It's like you have to have a brand deal or a sponsorship deal. The money doesn't come just from having subscribers. And it's like somebody was trying to advise me the day before yesterday on what it is that I need to do to get more subscribers and more views. And I'm like, I don't need, it's like, it's not a subscriber thing. Subscriber, it's like, that's, it's, 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 
you can't survive from a popularity contest. It's not about who could be more popular, who could see me, who could this, who. No, it's about how are you going to convert these views into dollars? And if you don't have a sponsor, you can't convert subscribers into dollars. It's like the little bit of money that you get from YouTube AdSense. It's like, it's not what people think it is. It's not. And then when you start adding some other components in there that I don't know if we really want to talk about, you know, it gets even harder depending on who you are. Like if you look at the, if you look at the, the breakdown of who is making it on YouTube, the, the breakdown of who's making it doesn't look like the faces of society, of the breakdown of society. Right. So, um, going back to the um, first night that you did the video, was that um, before or after you did the GoFundMe? No, the first video that I did letting people know was the GoFundMe video. Okay. And um, what was the time frame for that? So, uh, for, I was day 18. Uh, say that again? Day 18. Okay, um, what month? That was February. Okay. So this is like still fairly um, recent um, stuff that's happening. Um, I really was. You know what? I thought that I would raise about $1,000. Um, you know, cause it's like, you know what, it's like when you put up a post, you put like, especially now, like I said, Facebook wants you to pay to promote your post. So I, so I figure if I put this up, maybe I'll get a thousand dollars, you know, um, maybe just enough to really just kind of hold me over. I figured I would get maybe a thousand. So I, so I set it at 10,000 just because I just, I just, I just threw what I thought was an impossible number out there. And I thought I would raise a thousand dollars. And in my very my very first day, I raised six six almost seven thousand dollars the very first day. And I was even now thinking about it, it makes me emotional because I had no idea, honestly. I had no I had no idea. I had no idea. Yeah, it had to feel um, overwhelming, and it still has to feel overwhelming um, because you put so much work and time, and you never really know um, how to really feel about you. Especially, you know, social media, where you're more likely to hear the negative than you are um, to hear the positives or focus on the positive, even. Um, yeah. So. Let's talk about the criticism for a second. Um, one of the big issues, of course, is the money. And in particular, people think that you are running a scam. They say you're not really living in the car and you weren't even homeless. Um, so not that she was actually admitted to me, but are you running a scam? Oh, Lord. The answer to that, no, no, that <laughs> I mean, the answer is no. And I think that I think that there's something really important in in those in those claims actually. I think that there's something really important in those claims. Um, and you know what? There's so there's so many things that are going on. There's so many things that are going on. Let's 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 talk about number one, right? Number one, a scam. Okay. Um, I said this in a video. You know, it's like it's not like I, I wasn't hatched. I came out of someone's womb. I went to kindergarten, junior high school, high school, college, and I have interacted and continue to interact with people in real life on a daily basis, right? And the one thing that you don't see, Shereng, what is the one thing that you don't see? I mean, it's like you hear a lot. I'll, I'll tell you since there's a lot of things you probably don't see. But the one thing that you don't see is you don't see people who know Tanya from real life saying that this is a scam. You don't see people who I went to high school with, friends, family. You don't see any of those people saying that this is a quote-unquote scam. The only people that you see saying that 
are people who are very far removed from the situation and people who are very far removed from me. So, you know, there's so many different things. There's a racial component to it. There's a gender component to it and why people are coming out with these attacks. Because if you look at the face of the people who are attacking me and who are saying that this is a scam and saying, don't help me, those are the people who look like me. They are black women and black men. And I want to ask you, Sharang, if I were an Asian woman, do you think that there would be an outpouring of Asian men saying, don't help this B-I-T-C-H, don't help this W-H-O-R-E? Would there be an outpouring of Asian men saying that? I'm, I'm asking you. Um, probably not. And that actually was one of my questions. Like, how do you think being a woman plays into this? Like, and that's um, the next part. There's a racial part and there's a gender com- 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 part, part to this as well. Okay. It is people notoriously discredit the word of a woman. If you look at the amount of women who came out against Bill Cosby, if you look at the laws that we have in place used to infringe upon the rights of women, when, when this guy came out, when the, when the first guy came out against this African Bambada guy, you remember that in the, in the news, one guy mm-hmm. came out. And it's like, oh gosh, there's so much that I can say about this, Sharang. There's so much that I can say about this. 47 women come out against Bill Cosby. And people still, they, they discredit the women. They don't believe it. This one guy comes out against African Bombada and everybody's like, oh, yeah, this, this guy's horrible, blah, blah, blah. And then on a different note, if you think about it, right, 47 women call one man a rapist and people don't believe it. If 47 men called one woman a hoe, how many people would not believe it, whether she was or wasn't? Right. So it's like it took, it took one man, one black man to come out and start talking about, I'm, a, I'm scamming, I'm this, I'm that. And then all of a sudden, all of a sudden the floodgates opened for people to come out and start attacking a person who they were not sure of whether or not this person, let's say, let's, let's say, let's say for, let's say for example, let's say, let's say I was scamming, right? And no one knew. On the flip side of that, I could have not been scamming, and people wouldn't have known that either, but they erred on the side of attacking a person who they were not sure whether was down or not. Mm. That's the part that was perplexing to me. And when we start talking about the displacement diary falling behind in terms of timeline, if I would have had to endure those severe attacks on the days when I was feeling my lowest, it would have been grueling for me. And so it's a good thing that there was a little bit of cushion between the attacks that they were giving and actual real time. Right. Are you I'm here? I'm here. Okay. You just got really, really silent. I think I think there I think there are a lot of I think there are a lot of different things that are present in the displacement diaries. And you brought up a few of them, but it's even more complex than that. On the one hand, let me just, let me, let me, let me address some of those first. Yes, I think people are very unaware of what it actually looks like. When a person, when a person, when, 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 when Tony Robbins or Robert Kiyosaki or Tyler Perry, when these people say, I lived in my car, It sounds glamorous when you see the the successful part after. You're like, oh, that was just a down part. And then afterwards, wow, the swan is unveiled and everyone is like, oh, you know, they're clapping and they're applauding for who it is that you are today. But they don't know what it looks like in the midst of it. They don't know about the the emotional ups and downs. They don't know about the the struggle and the journey and the trying to keep all together. And what what does it look like if a person is living in their car? Where do you shower? What it looks like is washing up at the sink of Starbucks or going to the gym to catch a shower or trying to get a shower any place and anywhere that you can. That's what it looks like. It looks like going to the bus depot to brush your teeth. That's what it looks like. 
But, you know, it's like, oh, it sounds so glamorous after the fact. And I think people, so that's one. People are not really fully aware and cognizant of what it looks like during the journey. Two, people are not really aware of what it takes, what it takes to really start over. And if things do not cohese immediately, there's some stumbling, there's some faltering in between. It's like when you're trying to, to latch on to the new life and you're, you're stumbling away from the old one. That's two. They don't know what that looks like. Three, there are people who are afraid to know what it looks like. There are people who are clinging tightly to their jobs because they won't give themselves permission to try. And so there are two other things that are happening that branch off from that. Because they won't give themselves permission to try, the reflection of somebody else trying is glaring when it comes to them. It's a glaring reflection of their own unwillingness to do that for themselves. And then conversely, on the opposite side of that, is the internal criticism that a person has for why they themselves would never allow something like that to happen in their lives. They're like on, on, one si- on the one side, this person going after their dreams makes it glaringly obvious that I'm not going after mine. And so me, mm-hmm. Tanya going after her dreams makes it glaringly obvious for the people who choose not to go after theirs. And so that feels uncomfortable for them. And so because they feel discomfort in themselves, they feel discomfort in seeing me because of what it is that it reflects back to them about them. Are they willing to do that? Would they be willing to have what it takes to go whatever, come what may, go forward? Do they have what it takes to do that? And when they see me and they see, am I willing to do what Tanya has done? And they know that they are not. It becomes glaringly obvious. And the pain that they feel in their own lives, they they reflect that back onto me. Why couldn't Tanya have felt like it was good enough to stay at her business? Why couldn't Tanya have felt like it's good enough to stay on someone's couch? Why couldn't Tanya have felt like it was good enough to prostitute herself for somewhere to stay? Listen, I was out there. I know what it's like. I'm a woman. I did not have to be displaced, Shereng. I did not have to be. I could have prostituted myself night one. There's so many men who are willing to take a woman in on their couch in exchange for sex. And there are going to be some people who are reading this article right now who are living lives that they don't want to live. Uh, uh, uh.